Um, I'm Shrey Anand. I'm a data scientist, and I'm collaborating with Emerging Technologies Office of the CTO at Red Hat. So um, I've been studying AI and language models for the last 10 years, five years in the industry, and then five years studying this in my grad school. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this time where we are seeing this field um, getting so much attention and then also real applications coming out where um, it's kind of revolutionizing how we are doing software, how we are doing other things in uh, the knowledge work. So today I'll be talking about the history of these language models and how it started, what were like some of the first things that people tried out and how it has gone from there. So we'll start with some early language models, so things that people did in 1950s to 1990s, uh, and then how that led to the statistical approaches, uh, which kind of got evolved into chat GPT and those tech that we see today. Uh, there's also the evolution of machine learning models uh, to neural networks and then transformers and LLMs that we see now. Uh, and during this presentation, I'll be also sharing some of the libraries and frameworks that people use to actually code some of these technologies. So just to set the scope of the talk, um, there's also ethical, environmental, and economical impacts of this technology, but then those are like talks of their own. So we're not gonna discuss them here. And similarly with security, privacy, and legal aspects of this. Um, also from a core research perspective, image, audio, video, and multimodal models are also kind of changing how we do things, but they have their own um, growth and their own evolution uh, that we could probably talk in some other in some other time. So to begin with, um, I quickly want to talk about what natural language processing is. So it's the discipline of building machines that can manipulate human language or data that resembles human language in the way that it's written, spoken, or organized. And within NLP, there are like several tasks that people have historically tried to deal separately. But with like really powerful language models, um, we, are try we are seeing a trend where they kind of deal with all of them together through one model. But nevertheless, it makes sense to understand how this evolved and what were like the initial tasks that people started with. So I'm gonna mention some of them here. Um, so for example, syntax parsing and co-reference resolution were one of the initial tasks that people try to solve. So syntax parsing is basically just taking unstructured text and then getting structured entities out of those texts. Co-reference resolution is a task where you have a, a story or an article that talks about a person, and in the next sentence, they are referred by a pronoun like they, them, and then we want to reference that pronoun back to that person. So that's a task for the computers to understand. Um, similarly, there's like information retrieval, where you have a query, and then you need a bunch of uh, answers for that query, and then you look at a corpus of documents trying to find that answer. So that's one of the uh, important tasks of natural language processing. And then if you have heard of the RAG pattern, or retrieval augmented generation, that pattern basically involves uh, techniques borrowed from this field of information retrieval. Then there's like named entity recognition. So if you have a piece of text and there's, there's like 
places or businesses or entities in that text, you would want to extract those for uh, like discovery or trying to know which companies or places are listed in that piece of text. Um, similarly, there's like tasks such as sentiment analysis, where you have a piece of text and you want to know if it's positive or negative, um, or what kind of emotion runs through those text pieces. Um, so some of the more involved tasks for natural language processing involves machine translation. So you have Czech language and you have English language, and if you want to translate, um, models can do that now. Similarly, if you have a paragraph and you want to answer questions, so there were like there was again a whole evolution of question answering systems that led to Chat GPT that we have now. So those are some like basic tasks. Um, the first kind of systems that people created to solve some of those tasks were basically rule based, and they were simple um, if this then that kind of systems. So you had like workflows where um, you would define that if someone enters a query, then what you're going to do. So an easy way of understanding that would be like an Amazon chatbot. So you order stuff from Amazon, and then if you want to return that order, you talk to an assistant, which is a rule-based system that asks you for an order ID, and asks you several questions, and then based on that, it creates a um, return order for you. So that's like a simple example, but then in around like 2000s, people also experimented with some advanced rule-based systems. So uh, a famous one is IBM's Watson Jeopardy. So Jeopardy was a TV show where a host would ask people questions about closed categories, and then whoever answered those questions won that particular game. So IBM created the software that could beat the best performers of that game. And that software was basically a rule-based system that was connected to a knowledge base. So they created a Wikipedia knowledge base of those uh, questions that the host would ask. And then they used string matching, um, hypothesis generation, and gathering evidence to find the final answer. But that system was powerful enough to beat really good performers. Um, so although these systems were effective, but then they couldn't be scaled uh, because they work only for a closed system. Whereas if you see something right now, you can ask that GPT anything and it, it would answer. So um, what really gave way to that was statistical language models. And uh, for this talk, I created a notebook or an experiment kind of thing. I will quickly try to open that. Right, so um, some of the initial language models were really naive in terms of like how they handle statistics. So um, it like the first thing that we could talk about here is an n-gram language model. And what that does is, uh, if take an example here, so it says, I love natural language processing because natural language processing is fun. And um, this kind of statistical model would try to pair words together. So a bigram model would look something like um, a model that would pair words like I and love, that would be one bigram. Then love and natural, that would be another bigram. And then it would try to find the frequencies of those bigrams. So um, if you look at natural language here, so that's a bigram that appears twice in the sentence. 
And so the frequency of that biogram would be 2. And then this is like a very simple example, but then if you have a text uh, that spans a, like 500 words or 700 words, you would have a representative frequencies of these biograms. But then like um, creating those biograms and then also trigrams instead of two words and th you take three words, you can define very simple functions that would help you predict the next word. Um, so in this case, the predict next bigram or predict ne next tri trigram would just look at those frequencies and when you would enter a word like natural, it's gonna look at those frequencies and based on that predict the next word. So here if I run this, it's going to predict language for natural and if I predict the next trigram for natural language, it's going to do processing. And it does that because um, the frequencies for these are greater than just single one. Um, and this is a very simple example, but the limitation with this kind of approach is that you cannot look beyond the two words that you're talking about. So it misses the entire context of the paragraph or uh, the bigger document that you're talking about. So people thought that there need to be a method where there can be, the pro there can be a better way to estimate probabilities of what the next word should be. And so that kind of led into hidden Markov models which were uh, basically probability estimation graphs. Um, I'm gonna take this one for example. So this was one of the first approaches that tried to find a hidden structure in the sentences that people wrote. So uh, there is a logical organization of nouns and verbs and determinants when we are constructing sentences and then we are writing. So uh, this is a very simplified version of a Markov model, but what this is saying is that pi or pi is the starting state. And then we have uh, nouns and verbs and other as your additional states. So if you start from pi, then there's a 0.65 probability uh, that the first word is going to be from the other category. So the other category could be like the word the. So the sentence could start with the word the. And then there's a 0.7 probability that it's going to go to a noun. Uh, so like the and then followed by a noun. And then it's going to go to a verb or another noun. So uh, these are called transition probabilities and you learn them based on the text piece that you provide to the model. There's also emission probabilities here where if you're on a state that is verb, then that verb could correspond to uh, one of the many verbs that exist in your training data. So here, uh, there's a point to probability that the verb could be sleep. So you use this kind of structure to estimate the next word. Um, and so just for an example, the training data for uh, this looks like all the words in a sentence, so like natural language, and then a label for them, which says if they're like noun or if they're verbs, or if they're a determinant, and so on. So we take this training data, we take a hidden Markov model trainer, and you get that from a library called NLTK, which was one of the few libraries that were used uh, for NLP like five, 10 years ago. And then uh, you can call uh, the generate next word function and it would generate something like, so if you start with the word natural, it would generate something like natural language processing, but then post that, it's gonna <coughs> generate words like language processing, language processing, and it's gonna like 
loop over that. Uh, the reason why that happens is because the, first of all, like the training data is very limited. It's just a demo example. But then also these models are not able to uh, understand the hidden structure in a way that more sophisticated models can, just because of the sheer size and also the architecture that they use. Um, so this was uh, really popular in the 90s. So if people wanted to do something like this, or in even other fields, HMMs were really popular. But then um, in 2000s and 2010s, there were um, machine learning models that got really famous. So um, instead of like just generating the next word, people also wanted uh, cases where they wanted to classify the text. So if they had a piece of text and they wanted to know the sentiment associated with it, um, they would use something like a naive base or a logistic regression. These algorithms basically help them classify uh, sentences based on what's in them, right? So if you look at the text example here, so there are like three sentences. Uh, I love natural language processing. It is fun. I dislike processing errors. And then you would assign labels to those sentences. So this is a very simple example. We just have positive and negative. So a label of one means positive and a label of zero means negative. Um, so here we had just had like three sentences, but in a real use case, you would have like thousands of these sentences and labels. And um, when you would use a library like sklearn, which was one of the most popular ones for doing your classic machine learning uh, programming, and it would um, take these sentences and labels and create a machine learning model. So you would call model.fit uh, based on the sentences and the labels, and then you could call the predict function of that model to give you um, the prediction for an unknown sentence. So we can try this out here. Um, so for the example here, which is I love natural language processing, it would give a prediction of one. And similarly, we can run this for all the text examples that we took. So if you take a look at the last example, it would give a prediction of negative. Again, so this is trained on a very small number of samples just for a demo purpose, but uh, once we increase the number of training samples, the performance improves. And that's kind of also true with all machine learning um, algorithms and models, be it text or video or images. There is a certain benefit that you get when you increase the number of samples. So this was your vanilla machine learning models, but somewhere around 2010s, uh, people started looking into neural networks. They existed as a technology from 1960s, but there was like an upshoot in the compute power that people had access to. And then that kind of uh, led to people trying out neural networks in natural language processing. Um, so one of the most Key uh, concepts here is of word embeddings. Uh, and by the way, the neural, neural network looks like something in the middle where you have these input words. So in this case, it's going to be a dog, a cat, and a car. And um, you're going to take vectors or numbers for these things, and you're going to enter it in a neural network. A neural network is basically a number processing system that can take these input things, add mathematical function on top of them, and give you something uh, that separates these input objects in a meaningful way. So uh, inside there, uh, these circles are basically neurons, and these arrows point a uh, mathematical way to go from one layer to the other. 
So there are like multiple hidden layers in, in between, and all of them are connected through mathematical functions. So, um, right, so in this example, uh, what we get out is an embedding space where the numbers or the vectors associated with a cat or a dog are very similar, or in other, way, in other words, they are close together. So if we take a cosine of the vectors for these uh, number, a cosine of these vectors, that will be less than the cosine of the vector for a cat and the vector of a car. So in other words, this neural network has found a way to create a space where it can differentiate between similar and different topics. Um, and that kind of helps in the information retrieval task that I talked about in the beginning. So the direct applications of this algorithm can be seen in um, your Spotify or YouTube recommendation systems, where you have like these music, um, music playlists, mu songs, and then you can um, find similar songs um, and then put them in the same embedding space versus songs that are different. So, um, these like word embeddings are still used with your chat GPT um, language models as something that augments it, so retrieval augmented generation. The retrieval part happens with these um, embedding models. So the way to like implement that is simple. We have a library called Gensim, which was one of the first one that implemented this. Uh, you take sentences and words in those sentences, you call the word to vec model, and then it gives you a vector for words. Uh, in this case, it's the word natural, but then you can use this vector for comparing it with other words that are similar to natural or dissimilar to natural. So uh, this was the embedding model, but then what really paved the way for um, chat GPT and GPT-like architectures were RNNs, LSTMs, and transformers. So uh, the problem with word embeddings was that it wasn't able to differentiate between words in different contexts. So for example, if you have a word bank, then it can be used in a financial context and it can also be used as a river bank. But then a word embedding model was not uh, constructed to differentiate between those two. So people found a need for better models and so they created recurrent neural networks, which basically uh, took your sentences in a sequence and then connected them through uh, a feed forward network. So, here in this image, you see x0 to xt. So think of them as different words. So x0 could be I, this love, natural, language, and so on. And this A is basically a feed forward network, kind of neural network that I showed before. Um, and that leads into uh, these output states, h0 to hd. So an example here would be a machine translation use case where you want to take this sentence here and then translate into the Czech language. So this network is going to take these words, x0, x1, x2, and then find corresponding outputs for uh, the Czech language here in h0, h1, h2, and hd. So, um, the, th this network was really powerful in 2010s because it was something that started generating uh, coherent text. So if we gave it a sentence in English, it would generate a coherent translation of that in the Czech language. However, there were like many uh, problems with this network because people like created these feed-forward networks and connected them, but then the number of parameters suddenly rose, 
and that led to difficult training of these models. So people started uh, changing the architecture, so adding like smart ways so that these models could be trained. And that, that was like the LSTM wave, uh, long short-term memory models. I'm going to skip over them in the interest of time. But uh, what really happened uh, around 2018 was this transformer model. And it basically had two major contributions. So instead of the RNMs that I talked about that took those words sequentially, so uh, like what you saw x0 to xt, I love natural language processing, this model was able to take multiple sentences in parallel and that helped training a larger model with larger number of data points. Uh, I mean it's still like really hard to train these models, you need like tons of GPU resources but then this architecture allows you to do that in parallel. And the second thing, um, second thing that this architecture brought about was this concept of multi-head attention. Uh, what this really does is that it looks at the sentence that you are inputting. So I love natural language processing. And within that sentence, it forms a matrix that allows you to put attention on a specific word for that task. So if you're doing a translation, then um, when you're translating, some of the words in the sentence are more important than the others. So it really helps you get those attention layers. And uh, that makes a lot of difference when you train these models and you need them to uh, understand the context of the words and the paragraphs that it's trained on. So in 2018s, uh, there were GPT-2 and the BERT models that were really powerful and then they would be able to do all of those tasks that I described to an accuracy never seen before. Um, however, the responses that people got uh, from those models were not enough, so they created more refined ways of uh, fine tuning and training those models. So if you see an example of GPT-2, uh, and by the way, you can use them with a package called transformers. So this is a um, hugging face library that helps you uh, do text generation or classification with any of the models that I just talked about. And if I give it an input like I love natural language processing, uh, it would add the following text and that sounds like an interesting topic. As another good example, it will just keep on generating. So um, that was good, but then what really changed the game was uh, this way of training these transformer architectures, which is what Chad GPT <laughs> basically uses. So it starts with uh, low quality data, which is the entire internet, and it trains a transformer model uh, that you have uh, at the bottom on the left side, so that's a pre-trained LLM. So it's trained on everything that's on the internet, and you have more than a trillion tokens or words. Um, the second stage of this is you take prompt and response pairs, so you have thousands of labeled data points. You take that pre-trained model, you fine tune that for thousands of those examples. So now your model knows what to do when um, you have um, prompt and response pairs. And finally, there is the reinforcement learning layer that just rates the responses of those models. So OpenAI hired a bunch of people who would just look at the responses and uh, fine tune the model further. So that kind of led into these models that were really good at understanding 
what the input query was, and then generating the final answer. So um, there's uh, more examples here in the notebook. Uh, I have linked all of this, including the slides, in a GitHub repository that's linked on the DevConf uh, resource section. So you guys can go ahead and try running some of this. Um, I have made this notebook so that you don't really need GPUs. Um, a normal laptop should be fine. So, but of course, like, if you have GPUs, then you can do some more advanced stuff. So I'm out of time, um, but I had a few more slides. I'm gonna uh, pause right now and ask, like, if there are any questions. If we still have time, I can just go over some of the last slides. 